Hello, and thank you for joining the National Keratoconus Foundation and our doctors from the Southern California College of Optometry for our series for optometry students on keratoconus and specialty contact lenses. We've launched this series to celebrate National Keratoconus Day and expand the education of students who have a, a special interest in managing keratoconus. The National Keratoconus Foundation was founded by families affected by keratoconus in 1986, and it's the oldest and largest organization dedicated solely to keratoconus. Since 2016, the foundation has been located in Irvine, California. The mission of the foundation is to provide information and advocacy for individuals with keratoconus by sending free educational materials, answering inquiries, and producing newsletters and webinars. The foundation also hosts roundtable discussions at professional meetings like the Academy, the American Academy of Optometry and ARVO for researchers and clinicians, and students are always welcome to participate in these. The National Keratoconus Foundation launched World Keratoconus Day five years ago, and it's now celebrated internationally by those who are affected by keratoconus. All students who view these lectures and sign up for the National Keratoconus Foundation newsletter in November will receive a gift from the National Keratoconus Foundation. I'm Erin Roof, the Chief of the Cornea and Contact Lens Services at SECO, and I'll be your moderator. Throughout these series of lectures, our SECO doctors will discuss various topics related to keratoconus diagnosis, management, and contact lens fitting. The cornea and contact lens faculty at SECO are all residency trained experts in fitting irregular corneas and managing anterior segment disease of all kinds. On top of patient care, our faculty teach SECO students in all things cornea and contact lenses and are involved in research and education for optometry students, residents, and clinicians at all levels. Our faculty member who is uh, going to be presenting to you for this lecture is Dr. Jessica Sun. Dr. Sun is a graduate of the Southern California College of Optometry and recently completed our residency in cornea and contact lenses. Um, upon finishing residency, she joined our faculty as a full-time faculty member um, and is now contributing to the education of all of our optometry students. So I'm excited, excited for you to hear what she has to tell you about corneal cross-linking. Thank you, Dr. Roof. So today I'm going to be going over an overview of corneal crosslinking. We'll start by going over the indications for why we recommend crosslinking for our patients. And then we'll consider some of the factors that we take into account with regards to selecting patients for this procedure. I'll also be reviewing some of the pre and post-operative expectations. And lastly, we'll go over a review of the outcomes and overall efficacy of the corneal crosslinking procedure. So let's dive right in. I'm going to start with some general um, information with regards to cross-linking. Cross-linking is actually um, a chemical reaction that involves the formation of covalent bonds between different molecules. And this reaction is typically initiated by things like heat, radiation, pressure, or different chemical catalysts. And cross-linking has been used across many different applications to strengthen the mechanical properties of different materials such as hardening dental fillings, curing adhesives, or stabilizing prosthetic cardiac valves. And corneal crosslinking, which is the procedure we'll be focusing on today, is a process that actually occurs naturally, and that's been evidenced by some studies that have, ha that have shown um, an increase in the diameter of collagen fibrils over a patient's lifetime. And the corneal crosslinking procedure increases the rigidity of the cornea by using UVA radiation to create these new chemical bonds between the collagen fibrils. And that results in a stiffer cornea overall. So what are some of the indications for the corneal cross-linking procedure? The goal of this is to really strengthen the corneal tissue to halt the progression of corneal ectasia. And that's characterized by progressive thinning and protrusion of the cornea, which is usually associated with an altered or irregular collagen matrix. There are many forms of corneal ectasia including keratoconus, keratoglobus, pellucid marginal degeneration, as well as post-surgical or atrogenic ectasia. And the two that I've highlighted in blue here are the two FDA-approved indications for corneal cross-linking at this point. But today we'll be focusing on um, corneal cross-linking for the indication of keratoconus, as it is the most common form of corneal ectasia and also the most common indication for corneal cross-linking. So let's go over a review of keratoconus. Keratoconus is a non-inflammatory ectatic disorder that causes the cornea to become progressively thinner and steeper in curvature. 
The cited overall prevalence will really vary. Some studies show that it's uh, as common as one in 2,000 individuals, and it goes up to one in every 375. And this variability in prevalence just depends on the geography where we're sampling and also the criteria for how we diagnose keratoconus. Typically, we'll see um, the onset occur in adolescents, so in the teenage years, and it'll generally progress in a variable fashion, but typically slow down when the patient is in their 30s and 40s. Oftentimes, the, the presentation is bilateral, but can be asymmetric. And there's been shown to be associations with things such as eye rubbing, atopic conditions, or co uh, collagen vascular disease and connective tissue disorders. And there's also been shown to be an increased risk with uh, patients who have fa positive family history. So on the right hand side here, I've included some photos of the common clinical signs that can be detected with patients who have keratoconus, such as Vogue's striae, which are vertical, vertically oriented fine lines in the posterior stroma. You can also detect stromal thinning, as well as Fleischer's ring, which is an iron deposition ring located in the deep epithelium. And that's typically um, located around the base of the cone. In more advances, in more advanced cases of keratoconus, you can also um, see apical scarring over um, the tip of the cone. So let's go over a review of the management of keratoconus. Um, the thinning and the protrusion that's associated with the progression of keratoconus can lead to the development of irregular astigmatism and also distortion that can overall lead to a worsening of uncorrected vision. And in addition, scarring can also limit the patient's visual acuity as well. So prior to corneal cross-linking, we generally advise patients to try and alter their modifiable risk factors as much as possible. So we really encourage them to avoid eye rubbing. We try to prescribe refractive correction in the form of glasses and contacts. And in some patients, we recommended um, surgical interventions or the uh, insertion of intracorneal ring segments or intacts to attempt to flatten the corneal shape. However, unfortunately, about 10 to 20% of patients still progress to require a corneal transplant, when they're, especially when these patients are no longer amenable to optical correction. So really, before corneal cross-linking was available, we lacked the ability to target the underlying biochemical mechanisms that led to progression of keratoconus. So in comes corneal cross-linking. So I'll go over a brief history of the development of this procedure. Corneal cross-linking was first proposed in the 1990s by researchers at the University of Dresden in Germany as a way to stop the progression of keratoconus. And in 2003, a pilot clinical study was conducted that really demonstrated favorable results, and it showed that progression was halted in all of the eyes treated. And in addition, 70% of the eyes that were treated also demonstrated a significant reduction in the K-max value or the maximum keratometry value measured. And so this pilot clinical study really set the impetus for further studies on corneal cross-linking. And in 2016, we gained US um, FDA approval for the indication of keratoconus. So what can be achieved with this procedure? I wanted to begin by going over our expectations. Um, with regards to the goals and limitations of corneal cross-linking. So the goal is ultimately to strengthen the corneal tissue and prevent further ectasia. And we want to ultimately preserve vision and prevent any additional vision loss. And really, you want to be able to reduce the likelihood that a patient is going to need a corneal transplant in their lifetime. However, some of the limitations that we want to emphasize is that this is not a treatment to restore the cornea to a more regular shape. And the purpose of the cross-linking procedure is also not aimed necessarily at improving visual acuity, nor is it a procedure to reduce the dependence on glasses or contacts lenses for the patient, and is definitely not a last-ditch effort. So we want to emphasize that this procedure is designed to stop the disease process, not to reverse it. So patient selection, who should we recommend for corneal cross-linking? Currently, this procedure is FDA approved for the treatment of progressive keratoconus for patients who are 14 years of age and older. So let's talk about age. Um, when we're considering age, we know that even though the FDA approved indication is for patients who are 14 years of age, we can still perform this procedure off-label. And we know that the diagnosis of keratoconus can 
occur as early as four years of age. Remarkably, the collaborative longitudinal evaluation of keratoconus study showed that patient age between 10 to 20 years old is actually considered a significant predictor for progression and scarring. And so we know that there's a tendency for more severe presentation and also more rapid progression in children. So ultimately, we can argue that these patients would probably benefit very significantly from a procedure that could potentially slow down the progression of the disease. So we really want to emphasize that early diagnosis is key, and we want to watch out for early signs, such as a rapid increase in the degree of myopia and astigmatism that we find on refraction, or if we have a difficult time completing a refraction or, or we have inconsistent results. We also want to keep a close watch for our patients who engage in vigorous eye rubbing or have severe ocular allergies. And lastly, we want to maintain a low threshold for ordering tests to help us assess the shape of the cornea. So low threshold for ordering corneal topography or tomography testing in order to catch this early on. So a decision ultimately needs to be made whether we want to treat um, our patients when we diagnose them with keratoconus versus closely monitor them to assess for progression. And in pediatric cases, which again, tend to present more aggressively with higher likelihood for rapid progression, uh, we can consider recommending treatment once we um, diagnose these patients without waiting for progression. However, it is recommended to engage in a case-by-case -case assessment in this higher risk group so if you have a patient who has relatively advanced stage of keratoconus, the um, topography shows very evident signs of disease, it's probably um, a good idea to talk to the parent, let them know the benefits of immediately treating with corneal cross-linking. However, we have, if we have a patient with mild forms of the disease, good vision, maybe the topography is undefined or ambiguous, we could consider careful observation at least with frequent exams every three to six months, perhaps, to make sure that if there is progression, we catch it right away. So on the opposite end of the spectrum, when we're considering age, we know that the risk of progression with care of keratoconus declines as the patient gets older. So we expect the cornea to become more stable when the patient hits their 30s and 40s, like I mentioned earlier. And so it is appropriate to monitor for evidence of progression in our older patients before deciding to treat with corneal cross-linking. And we know that several studies have shown that older patients tend to have a positive response to corneal cross-linking, and we know good stability after they undergo the procedure. However, when we compare the functional improvement, these older patients may not have um, much functional improvement compared to our patients who are younger. And that's probably because as we age, there are age-related crosslinks that develop that, are, that tend to be more stable and less prone to change. And there's actually one study that showed that in age over 35 was considered a risk factor for vision loss after corneal crosslinking. And so we need to take into account that there may be um, less effectiveness with increased uh, failure and complication rates. So ultimately, we want to consider Corneal cross-linking for our older individuals who demonstrate progressive ectasia. And I definitely want to emphasize that we still need to monitor older patients for long-term progression because the expression of keratoconus can be really variable and these patients can still progress when they're older. And so depending on what we see, we'll recommend, um, we'll recommend them for cross-linking on a case-by-case -case basis. Okay, so We've been talking a lot about progression. So how do we define progression? Currently, there's no real clear, there's not really a clear set of criteria to define what this is. However, the Global Consensus on Keratoconus and Ectatic Diseases Committee suggested that progression is evident if there's a change and in a, there's a change for the worse in at least two of the following categories. So the first being steepening of the anterior surface, the second being steepening of the posterior surface, and then the third being corneal thinning. But quantitatively, what does that mean? So I gathered um, in this table to the right, a summary of some of the diverse criteria for progression that have been used across several different corneal cross-linking studies in the past. And as you can see, there's many different parameters that we can consider. So we can consider looking at a change in refraction. We can consider looking at 
changes in corneal topography, in corneal thickness, or in uncorrected or corrected distance visual acuity. So overall, there are multiple factors to weigh in when we're considering the overall picture of progression. What are some contraindications for the corneal cross-linking procedure? So the first one I wanted to focus on is a cor the corneal thickness requirement. And a corneal thickness of 400 microns is, is set as a safety margin um, to protect the corneal endothelium from damage from some of the free radicals that are released during the corneal cross-linking process. So you don't want the cornea to be too thin because you don't want to damage, uh, cause further damage to um, those cells at the uh, posterior side of the cornea. And we can artificially increase the thickness of the cornea by soaking the cornea in a hypoosmotic solution. It's going to buff up the thickness so that some patients who might be on the borderline can still go through this procedure safely. Another relative contraindication is if a patient has had a prior history of a herpes eye infection, um, it's thought that the, this procedure could result in reactivation of the virus. Other contraindications include if the patient has severe corneal scarring already, if they have autoimmune disorders, history of poor wound healing or severe ocular surface disease, and if they're currently pregnant or breastfeeding. So let's go over some of the preoperative expectations um, that we would want to review with our patients. So I'll briefly start by introducing the key elements involved in the cross-linking procedure. So like I mentioned, the cross-linking procedure involves a chemical reaction. We want to combine riboflavin, which is a vitamin B2 drops, and then ultraviolet light to strengthen the cross-links between the collagen fibers in the cornea. So the first component is using long wavelength UVA radiation to excite the vitamin B2 molecules, and that will lead to the release of oxygen-free radicals that allows for the formation of these strong covalent bonds and ultimately lead us to develop increased corneal rigidity. So what does the procedure itself actually involve? The Dresden protocol or the FB off cross-linking protocol is the current FDA approved cross-linking procedure. The first step in this procedure involves the removal of the central eight to nine millimeters of epithelium, so the front surface of the cornea. And after that epithelium is removed, we saturate the corneal stroma with that vitamin B2 riboflavin solution. And so the solution is applied every one to two minutes for a span of 30 minutes after which we make sure to take a corneal pachymetry measurement to make sure that the corneal thickness is adequate, so above that 400 um, micron value that we mentioned earlier. And then a UVA light is exposed, um, and we, we typically use a wavelength of 365 nanometers at the power of 3 milliwatts per centimeter squared for a period of 30 minutes. Then a bandage contact lens is placed over the cornea to improve the patient's comfort and also promote healing. There are alternative protocols to the epi-off procedure. So one of the most common being the trans-epithelial cross-linking method or the epi-on method, where the epithelium is left intact. And some of the pros of this procedure are improved patient comfort, quicker visual recovery, reduced complications, and also, we can consider this as an option for patients with thinner corneas. However, some of the cons could be the consideration of um, suboptimal riboflavin penetration because the epithelium acts as a barrier to the riboflavin from soaking in thoroughly through um, the corneal stroma. And so, when we look at a comparison of the epi on method of cross linking versus the epi off, the traditional method, there's inconsistent results in efficacy. Some studies show that there's really no difference when we take a look at the visual acuity measurements or the keratometry measurements. However, other studies favor the epi-off uh, method. There are current clinical studies being done looking at the effect of adding in supplemental oxygen to this procedure, increasing the UV irradiation used to accelerate the procedure, using higher riboflavin concentrations, and also enhancing the riboflavin concentrations 
in order to improve that penetration through the epithelium. So these are just some of the current studies that are ongoing at this point. So in addition to describing what occurs during the cross-linking process, there's also additional pertinent information that you can give to your patients who are considering undergoing the cross-linking procedure. So I usually like to mention to them that it's a relatively quick, minimally invasive outpatient procedure. Typically takes around the order of one to two hours. Usually we'll do um, one eye at a time because the patient will have reduced vision immediately following the procedure. But that really depends on the surgeon and also on the patient's occupational and functional needs. During the procedure, they'll be provided with local anesthesia and a mild sedative to relax them um, throughout that one to two hour process. And then in terms of patient costs, we usually um, estimate the cost per eye to be around $2,500 to $4,000. In terms of insurance coverage, only the FD approved products and procedures are covered typically. And so the only FD approved procedure is the EPI off procedure. And then the only approved cross-linking device is the KXL system by Vitro, which is the system that delivers the UV light. And then the only riboflavin, content, uh, riboflavin solution that is FDA approved is the Cotrexa solution by Avidro as well. So insurance coverage for cross-linking is expanding all across the United States. And so it's a good idea to contact the patient's insurance provider prior to treatment to see if they currently provide coverage for corneal cross-linking as cost could be a barrier for some of our patients. And so if you want to take a look at this website, livingwithkeratoconus.com slash insurance, you can take a look at some of the plans that currently cover cross-linking across the different states. This is just an example of a medical policy um, laid out by one of the insurance carriers. And you can see the policy guidelines in terms of how they define progression of keratoconus. So there's, there might be different guidelines um, that are put out by these different insurance carriers. And it's a good idea to become familiar with the different um, definitions of progression. So now let's go over some of the potential adverse events that could occur. Some of the most common ocular adverse reactions related to cross-linking include corneal haze, punctate keratitis, corneal striae, an epithelial defect, or some pain following the procedure. Corneal haze is the most frequently reported finding associated with corneal cross-linking, and there's been several studies that have reported some degree of haze in, in all of the eyes that have been treated with cross-linking. This is a dust-like haze in the anterior stroma. Some of the proposed risk factors for this haze include reduced corneal thickness, increased average corneal curvature, and an age over 35 years old. In a small proportion of cases, there's um, deep stromal opacification or scarring, and this is more longstanding, dense, and could cause visual acuity impairment. If we look at the development of haze and how it resolves over time, we expect that around one month after surgery is the peak um, of haze as, as can be detected with OCT imaging. It begins to clear between three to six months following the, the surgery and improves up to 12 months after. Microbial keratitis is one of the most severe potential complications of corneal cross-linking, and luckily the incidence of infectious keratitis after cross-linking is extremely low, quoted at around 0.0017%, and that's thought to be because the procedure itself is bactericidal and fungicidal, but we have to consider that we are removing or debriding the epithelium, using bandaged contact lenses, and prescribing the patients with corticosteroids immediately following the surgery, and this could potentially facilitate the proliferation of different microbes. There's several reported inciting pathogens, and they could be bacterial, viral, or fungal in nature, and there's also been some cases that have been linked to a campanula as well. Endothelial cell damage after cross-linking is another concern that we mentioned earlier, 
And this could result from endothelial exposure, again, to the free radicals that are generated from the cross-linking process. And it's thought to be facilitated by some thinning that occurs interoperably during the UV exposure. Some other factors that could contribute to this damage could include an inflammatory reaction to the riboflavin solution, um, incorrect UVA light focus or incorrect calibration, um, an error in or lack of pachymetry reading, or if the patient has an underlying endothelial dystrophy, such as Hughes endothelial dystrophy. Corneal crosslinking can also activate the immune response and start an endothelial inflammatory process. So now that we review the procedure itself, let's focus on some of the post-operative expectations with regards to corneal crosslinking. So we can let our patients know that immediately following the procedure, they can experience some discomfort or perhaps a foreign body sensation. They can feel gritty or burning sensation for the first few days, and they'll likely be light sensitive. And so we'll usually recommend UV protection immediately following. They'll be prescribed some antibiotic and anti-inflammatory drops to use for the first few weeks, as well as a Fox shield at night to protect their eye from any mechanical trauma. Importantly, we want to let our patients know that vision will tend to be worse following the procedure, but visual recovery will be expected to occur gradually over the um, subsequent weeks or months. And so some of the restrictions that your patients uh, should be aware of is that they should avoid eye rubbing for the first week, avoid swimming for two weeks, and usually will avoid contact lens wear for the first four to six weeks, depending on the type of contact lens that they're wearing or they were wearing prior to the surgery. In terms of follow-up periods and follow-up uh, visits, several visits are indicated in order to ensure that the epithelium heals and to remove the bandage contact lens that we placed immediately following the procedure, and also across the different months in order to track the progression of keratoconus following the procedure. And this is especially important in the first year. So let's review some of the outcomes now of corneal cross-linking. So if we take a look at some of the randomized control trials looking at cross-linking for keratoconus with at least a 12-month follow-up period, all of them show a statistically significant positive effect of corneal cross-linking on the change in the pain max value or the maximum corneal refractive power, sometimes also called the maximum topographic keratometry reading. Some studies also found a positive effect on visual acuity, so an improvement in unaided or aided distance visual acuity. And overall, there's been very few complications and adverse events reported. So let me focus in on the US phase three clinical trials, uh, which was a multi-center randomized controlled trial um, looking at cross-linking for the treatment of progressive keratoconus. So in this study, they had about 205 patients. Half of the patients received corneal cross-linking, and the other half was the control group. Um, these patients received riboflavin drops, but did not receive UV radiation or epithelial debridement. And I'll briefly go over the outcomes that they took a look at. So the first variable that I want to focus on is changes in topography. And the study showed that the cornea can flatten after corneal cross-linking. And there was a statistically significant difference in the mean K-max value in the corneal cross-linking group compared to the control group. And overall, on average, the patients who were in the corneal cross-linking group had an average flattening of 1.6 diopters in that first year following the surgery. And if you take a look at the graph on the right, you'll see that, that this is the general trend but of um, the maximum K value or the K max value following the procedure. So at one month post-op, there's actually a little bit of steepening that we see. And then from then on out up to 12 months, we see progressive flattening. And so that's where they developed that average mean flattening of about 1.6 diopters in the first year following the cross-linking procedure. When we take a look at visual acuity, improvement in visual acuity is also possible after cross-linking. And when they compare the cross-linking group 
to the control group, they saw that there was a significant improvement in the corrected distance visual acuity before surgery and 12 months after the surgery. And so that improvement was actually better than one line. And if we look at the proportion of patients who gained at least two lines of letters after the surgery, that was actually about a fourth of all the patients who were treated. So we can see that about a quarter of the patients achieved a clinically meaningful improvement in their corrected distance visual acuity as a result of corneal cross-linking. Um, notably, 6%, however, lost two or more lines of acuity, and so we know that some eyes do continue to progress regardless of the procedure. Looking at the long-term outcomes, we can see that the early functional improvement that we discussed is actually retained over the long term. So there's been several studies that have demonstrated that the results of the cross-linking um, are actually stable across a span of 10 years when we're considering the reduction of the K-max values and the improvement in visual acuity over time. So we can see that there's a, if the flattening of the K-max is actually sustained across the period of 10 years in this graph to the right. So I wanted to summarize the overall efficacy of cross-linking. We know that cross-linking demonstrates a greater than 90% success rate for halting the progression of keratoconus. And ultimately, our ability to halt the progression of keratoconus has really significant implications for reducing the need for corneal transplantation, which again is around 10 to 20% of patients at this point. So we can save a lot of resources in terms of surgical time, follow-up time, and also donor tissue. And there's already been some studies that have shown that there's been a reduction in the proportion of transplants needed for keratoconus after cross-linking was approved. And that's been shown in studies done in Canada, in Norway, and also in the Netherlands. And importantly, even though long-term studies have demonstrated that there's a sustained positive effect when we're looking at the average data for patients, there's still a small subset of patients who continue to progress after cross-linking and they might need retreatment. But some of the factors that will contribute to this may include patients with a preoperative K-max of greater than 50 diopters, so a very, very steep cornea, patients who have engaged in vigorous eye rubbing or have history of severe ocular allergies um, that might be contributing to this likelihood of continued progression following the first cross-linking treatment. So in conclusion, cross-linking is a safe and effective treatment for halting the progression of keratoconus. We really want to emphasize early diagnosis and frequent monitoring in order to identify candidates for corneal cross-linking. And this is especially important for our younger patients who are more likely to progress rapidly. We should really be considering early intervention with cross-linking when, when appropriate. So we don't want to recommend this too late in the process because remember, this is not a treatment to reverse the disease. And after cross-linking, we want to emphasize close monitoring and follow-up in order to continue to track uh, any progression that could occur. And finally, corneal cross-linking has really altered the paradigm for managing corneal ectatic disease and demonstrates a lot of potential to reduce the need for corneal transplantation and ultimately improve the quality of life for our patients. So that concludes uh, my presentation. Here are my references. Thank you, Dr. Sun. That was really great. Um, I've got one question for you. Um, when do you typically start or resume um, fitting contact lens where or co fitting contact lenses with these patients after after crosslinking. So typically, um, I will wait at least four to six weeks um, before resuming contact lens wear, especially if patients are um, in rigid contact lenses. Um, we do want to wait for that epithelium to heal and for any remodeling to take place after the crosslinking procedure. We want to make sure that the corneal shape or the profile is stable in terms of the steepness and the elevation. And we also want to make sure that the vision is stable as well. So one thing to consider, though, is that patients have different functional needs. And even if we want to wait longer to refit these patients or reintroduce them to contact lens where 
that might not be feasible depending on their day-to-day -day activities or perhaps their occupation. And so it is a case-by-case -case basis, but usually we let the patient know to expect um, to wait at least a month before everything settles in and stabilizes. Got it. So it'd probably be good for them to have some sort of backup spectacle that, that could help a little bit in that time, maybe. Mm -hmm. Correct. Yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you for this presentation. That was really excellent. And thank you to everyone who was listening. We'll see you at the next lecture.